story of the Mountbatten's can be said to begin in 1917. This was when my father changed our name from Battenberg to Mountbatten at the King's request. This was the result of a hysterical agitation which had caused the King himself to change his family name. This break with the past caused a good deal of consternation. All traditions were in the melting pot at that time, and disagreeable though this was for our family, far worse things were about to happen to us. 1917 marked the beginning of the fall of many royal houses, and we were not immune. Imperial Russia had had a terrible war. Loyally supporting her Western allies in 1914, her unready armies invaded East Prussia. They met shattering defeat at Tannenberg. Russian victories over the Austrians and Turks and a stubborn winter defensive could not make good the damage. In 1915, Germany and Austria set out to crush the Russian Empire. They failed. But Russian losses that year Killed, wounded, prisoners and deserters were about two million. The giant was almost on his knees. Yet in 1916, Russia revived, and a brilliant offensive inflicted irreparable damage on the empire of Austria-Hungary. But the cost was crippling. The hard winter of 1916-1917 brought the Russian people to breaking point. The defeats of the army were defeats of the imperial regime. In 1915, the Tsar Nicholas II made himself commander-in-chief of the army. Now he was directly blamed for all its failures. And with the Tsar at headquarters, it was the Tsarina who effectively ruled Russia. The Empress was not popular. She was believed to have German sympathies. She was known to be a firm believer in absolute autocracy. And she was a mystic, deeply under the influence of the corrupt monk, Rasputin. By 1917, the imperial family had become the focus of the disappointments and anger of the Russian people. A bread route in Petrograd in March turned instantly into revolution. Within a week, the Tsar had abdicated. 300 years of Romanov rule had suddenly crashed in ruin. The Tsar was my father's first cousin. The Tsarina was my aunt, my mother's sister. Another of her sisters, my aunt Elizabeth, had married the Grand Duke Serge. So our Russian connections were very close. We used to see our relations quite often, either in Germany or on visits to Russia. I loved Russia and I was very, very fond of my Russian cousins. These old family photograph albums bring back memories of all the happy times we used to have together in that almost unbelievable world of my boyhood before 1914. In this photo with my cousins, I was just 10, and my little cousin Alexei, the Tsarevich, is in the carriage. But I can find a better picture of him here. He was heir to the throne. He was about four years younger than me and had very poor health. In fact, he was a haemophilic, which was a great worry. His four sisters, the Grand Duchesses Olga, Marie, Anastasia, and Tatiana, were very, very attractive. I remember I always secretly hoped to marry Marie. The Russian court was astonishing. Everything was on the grand scale. The size of the imperial palaces, the physique of the guards, the Cossack outriders whenever we went for a drive, the splendor of the ceremony. It was the court of an autocrat. The Tsar's powers were absolute, quite unlike those of any other European monarch. The Tsar of all the Russias was answerable only to God for the way he ruled his country. Yet anyone less like an autocrat than my Uncle Mickey, it would be hard to imagine. He was a very kind-hearted, simple, charming man, but at the same time, 
rather weak and indecisive. He was never happier than when he was playing with his children. And now, all that was finished. All the splendor, all the happy memories were things of the past. My uncle had lost his throne. He and my aunt and all my cousins were under arrest. We were shocked and dismayed, but we didn't dream of the terrible things which were yet to come. The revolution in Russia in March 1917 was a liberal revolution. The imperial family remained under arrest in the palace of Tsarskoye Selo, but was not ill-treated. The revolution was welcomed in the West as a sign that Russia would now emerge from inefficiency and despotism and continue the war with new vigor. Almost no one outside Russia understood the deep war weariness of her people. In October, a second revolution brought to power the Bolsheviks, whose slogan was, down with the war. At Brest-Litovsk in March 1918, the Germans and Austrians forced the Bolshevik government to accept humiliating terms of peace. But inside Russia herself, there was no peace, only civil war. Soon the Bolshevik government seemed to be on the point of collapse. The imperial family was now in exile far to the east at Tobolsk. As anti-Bolshevik forces advanced westward, the possibility of rescue arose. The prisoners were moved again. The anti-Bolshevik troops arrived too late. At Ekaterinburg, on July the 16th, 1918, in this house, the Tsar and all his family were murdered by order of the local Soviet. We had very little news of the family after the Bolsheviks took over. We all hoped that they would ultimately be sent into exile but we feared the worst. Even when it happened, it was a long time before we heard the details, which were quite horrible. They were all shot together. I believe my cousin Alexei, who was just 14 years old, didn't die at once. He was shot three more times. And my cousin Anastasia was bayoneted 18 times as she lay there screaming. Even their doctor and their servants were murdered with them, and afterwards their bodies were hacked into pieces. And the following day, my Aunt Elizabeth, who had founded the nursing sister movement and was revered almost as a saint, was also murdered by being flung down a mine shaft. These horrible deeds cast a shadow over the whole of my family for a very long time. With the end of 1917 came the knowledge that the fall of Russia would permit the Germans to bring nearly a million men to the Western Front. By March 1918, the Germans were ready, and two terrible blows fell on the British army. In six weeks, the British lost a quarter of a million men. The Commander-in-Chief, Field Marshal Haig, issued a famous order of the day. There is no other course open to us but to fight it out. With our backs to the wall and believing in the justice of our cause, each one of us must fight on to the end. The British fought on, and in May and June, the Germans turned against the French. The French armies retreated nearly to Paris, and then once more, the Germans were held. Their losses were frightful, and Germany could not replace them. The limitless resources of America now poured in to replace the losses of the Allies. The mere sight of these cheerful, tall young men marching by tens of thousands down the roads of France brought new life to the Allied cause. In July 1918, there was a lull on the Western Front a short breathing space between great storms. It was during this lull that I had the great good luck to be one of the naval officers to visit the Western Front. I called it luck because the front was something that just had to be seen to be believed. Of course, I'd heard a great deal about it. One read about it every day in the papers, and I'd seen a lot of films of the fighting. But none of that really prepared me for what I saw. I went to GHQ where I met Sir Douglas Haig, 
people made a deep impression on me. I'd have been even more impressed if I had known that he was just about to win a series of great victories, which did more than anything else to end the war that year. I was shown bases, lines of communication, artillery positions, the whole amazing administrative background of fighting a major land war, something Britain had never done before. But above all, I saw the front line itself. I thought it was abominable. It's hardly possible to compare the utterly different kinds of war that were waged by the army and the navy. On the face of it, we in the navy had a less dangerous life. A second lieutenant in the army, I discovered, had an expectation of life of only about six or seven weeks on the Western Front. On the other hand, when disaster occurred at sea, it was usually a pretty complete disaster. At Jutland, when the Queen Mary blew up, nine men were saved out of a crew of 1,275. It was a similar story with the indefatigable and the invincible. I myself saw the battleship Vanguard blow up at anchor in Scarpa Flow and took a boat away to look for survivors. There were only two. We didn't think about these things much. We had our jobs to do, and we got on with them. But my visit to the Western Front was to prove of the greatest value. For now I was able to understand about war on land, what the casualties really meant, and the horror of the conditions in which those enormous numbers of men were fighting and dying. In July, the Allies began their final counter-offensive, the Second Battle of the Marne. In August, the British armies once again assumed the largest burden of the war. But now it was victorious war. In September, the British broke through the Hindenburg Line. In October, Germany put out feelers for peace. Revolution, which had already destroyed the Russian Empire and the Romanov dynasty, now threatened Imperial Germany and her allies. On November the 4th, the German fleet mutinied at Kiel. A few days later, Soviets seized power in Kiel and the great port of Hamburg. On the 9th, there was revolution in Berlin. the armistice was signed. The war was over. In the Allied capitals, there was jubilation, relief, and the hope of building a new world in which such a war could never happen again. In the defeated countries and in Russia, there was revolution, famine, civil war, and a bitterness which would also form part of the new world's inheritance. Once more, the collapse of an empire directly affected by a family. The German Empire in 1918 was ruled by the Kaiser, William II, who was also King of Prussia. Under him, there were scores of other rulers, there were kings of Saxony and Bavaria, Grand Dukes of Baden and Mecklenburg, Dukes of saxe coburg and so on. The revolution swept them all away. On the 9th of November, the Kaiser went into lifelong exile in Holland. And at the same time, the other German rulers also lost their thrones. Now, the Grand Duke Ernest Louis of Hesse was my mother's brother and my father's first cousin. So Hess was our family's centre. Like the Kaiser, he was a grandson of Queen Victoria. But there was never much love lost between the two houses, Prussia and Hess. In 1914, my uncle was almost alone among the German princes to speak out against the war. Now he'd lost his throne because of it, but was invited to stay on in his home because he'd always been a progressive ruler and had never lost the affections of his people. But all the same, another link with the past was broken. 
Britain had entered the war as the world's greatest sea power. Her victory was acknowledged on November the 21st, 1918, when the German fleet made its last journey across the North Sea to surrender to the Royal Navy. The surrender of the German fleet was a remarkable and ironic moment. I was then serving in the Portsmouth Escort Flotilla, and so I wasn't there to witness it, unfortunately. And nor, of course, was my father. Although, as first sea lord in 1914 and earlier, he'd played no small part in bringing about this event. I feel sure he was there in spirit. Just seven months later, the whole of this great fleet, at anchor in Scarpa Flow, was scuttled by its own crews. What an ignominious end. What an irony. And what a waste. The British had won their war, and they wanted to forget it. Millions of men in uniform waited impatiently to get out of it. We want civil suits, they proclaimed. We won the war, give us our tickets. By April 1919, Britain had demobilized two million men. It was in that month that the Grand Fleet also ceased to exist. At the end of the war, when King George V inspected it, it consisted of 370 British ships with 90,000 officers and men. this must have been the most massive single demonstration ever seen of British sea power. Now, this whole magnificent array was to be dispersed. The ships we knew so well were laid up in reserve to await obsolescence in the breakers' yards, and the wartime sailors went home. For regulars, of course, be mob at the end of a war can be not quite such a joyous affair. It never occurred to me that I might not remain in the Navy. I suppose if I thought about it at all, I realized that the fleet would have to be cut down and that a lot of regular officers would have to go. But such was my youthful self-confidence, I don't believe it ever crossed my mind that I might be one of them. And thank heaven I wasn't. I was 18 and a half when the war ended. I was a sub-lieutenant in an anti-submarine vessel, the P-31. She only had a small ship's company of 50, but we were all very proud of her. My pay was five bob a day, less than some of the petty officers when the new scales of pay came in. I had a small allowance for my father, 300 pounds a year, which represented quite a lot in those days. I looked forward to having some fun. I was barely 14, a little more than a child when war broke out. Although I had many happy memories of pre-war days, that wasn't really my world. My world began now. After the narrow existence of naval colleges, ships and bases in wartime, which was all I'd known for the last five years, I had a wonderful feeling of release. I could make new friends. I could enjoy some sport. I could go to dances. I could meet some girls. And I did all these things. That was really what peace meant to me. A whole new world at my feet. It was tremendously exciting. July 1919, the nation honored its heroes. Rank and file and leaders alike of Britain, the Empire and the Allied nations were honored at the victory parade through the streets of London. The King and Queen took the march past of contingents from all nations and all services. The great parade seemed to mark the unmistakable end of the war. Now the nation could settle down to normalcy, if such a thing existed. For Mountbatten and other members of the royal family, the first product of peace was unexpected. Like his cousins, Prince Albert and Prince Henry, he found himself at Cambridge University. My generation of naval officers had gone to sea at an absurdly young age. I was barely 16 and there were others younger than me. We were known as the war babies. 
And, of course, there was a deplorable gap in our general education. A gap which a wise and benevolent admiral had decided that they would fill. Sir Arthur Shipley was the master of Christ College and lived in the lodge over there. He was the vice chancellor of Cambridge University and arranged with the Admiralty to take the war babies in relays for two terms at a time to help with our general education here at Cambridge. He was a friend of my father's and so I came to Christ. In those days, of course, I wouldn't have been lord of where I to walk on the grass, but it was a privilege reserved for fellows. But as I've been made an honorary fellow of the college, I'm very proud to exercise the privilege now. We wore uniform by day, a cap and gown by night. I studied ethnology under Haddon, which interested me very much as a voluntary subject. But what was exciting was meeting new people, different people, finding a new world, and indeed a very exciting new world. I was uh, president of the Cambridge Union in the Lent term, 1920. And I remember that uh, Sub-Lieutenant Lord Louis Mountbatten, known to his friends as, in the Navy as Dickie Mountbatten, was on my committee. Rather unusual for a, for a, a naval officer to be on, a, on the Union Committee. He was the only one, but uh, he became a very good debater. I remember three debates in which he spoke. On one occasion, he opposed the return to party politics. Another occasion, he opposed the reduction of expenditure on armament. And uh, he was instrumental in getting Winston Churchill down to the great Oxford and Cambridge debate when the motion was that the time is ripe for a Labour government. Well, he opposed that. He and Winston Churchill opposed it. I was surprised at that because uh, we all thought him rather left-wing. Cambridge was a very important formative experience in my life. The contacts I made there enlarged my ideas and gave me a new view on many subjects. And no sooner had I left Cambridge than another wonderful broadening experience came my way. One which brought me a very close friendship. My cousin David, the Prince of Wales, was a most popular figure at that time. It was considered that nothing could be better for empire relations, an empire which was beginning to turn into a commonwealth, than a tour around it by the Prince of Wales. In March 1920, he was due to visit New Zealand, Australia, and the West Indies. And he invited me to go with him as flag lieutenant in the Battle Cruiser Renown. This was the chance of a lifetime. One constantly heard about the Empire, of course. It was all that vast area that was painted red on the schoolroom maps, and one of the duties of the Royal Navy was to protect it. But what did one really know about the Empire? Very little. Most of it was hard to get at. There was no air travel in those days, and practically no films to reveal it to us. So all I knew was what I'd read and heard. And now I was about to see for myself. The Prince of Wales was seen off at Portsmouth by his brothers, Prince Albert and Prince Henry. On March the 16th, 1920, the Royal Party set forth in the battle cruiser HMS Renown. Mountbatten, officially the flag lieutenant, appointed himself the diarist of the journey. He recorded that it lasted 210 days, 82 of them spent aboard the Renown, and the Prince travelled 45,497 miles. The first port of call was Barbados, but only briefly. The West Indies received fuller attention on the way home. Then the Panama Canal, with its locks one above the other, and wonderful machines to pull ships through. Typically, Mount Batten calculated that it took 6,000 million foot-pounds of work to raise the renown to her highest point. On April the 17th, she crossed the equator, and Mount Batten reported in his diary, At two bells in the forenoon watch, a fanfare of trumpets announced the arrival of His Majesty King Neptune. The chief herald came onto the quarterdeck, leading the procession. Next came the chief bears. After these followed the judge, two of his majesty's bodyguard, and his aquatic majesty, King Neptune himself, accompanied by his queen, Amphitrite, and his secretary. And then the instruction of the novices began. H.R.H. sat down in the barber's chair, 
and the doctor took his temperature, proclaiming it to be normal. His majesty, however, objected to this, pointing to Aetoraitis shaking knees. The doctor took his temperature again and came to the conclusion that his thermometer had stuck on the first occasion. So he gave Aetoraite a number nine pill, which was about the size of a golf ball. The chief barber then lathered him thoroughly and shaved him with a razor whose blade was three feet long. Suddenly, the chair was tilted backwards, and before he knew where he was, Aetoraite was in the grip of the bears who ducked him along the entire length of the bar. The flag of ten was then put into the barber's chair and given a double spoonful of number five, after which he was lathered in black, purple and white and tipped into the bar where he got his full 16 duckings. On April the 22nd, the renown arrived at Auckland and the prince and his party had their first experience of an anti padean welcome. 6,000 children spelt out the word, but it needed no spelling. Everywhere the prince went, the people of New Zealand turned out in thousands. Returned servicemen of the old Australian and New Zealand Army Corps, the Anzacs, always prominent among them. At Rotorua, the Maoris expressed their greeting with dances. Australia greeted the prince in her own exuberant style. In just under three months, he visited every state, every capital, and found time to see and be seen in many localities in the back blocks. Australia in 1920 was more to the left than any other part of the English-speaking world. Australian disrespect for authority was in any case a byword. There were sometimes doubts about how the prince would be received. No one needed bothered on that score. We on the staff, were often targets of the Australian sense of humour. Chayaking, it was called. Shouts of, oh, Percy, where'd you get that hat? And so forth. But even in districts which were supposed to be hotbeds of Bolshevism, the prince always met with tremendous affection. In fact, often it was a problem of protecting him from his enthusiastic admirers. Quite early on, he started the practice of shaking hands with his left hand because his right hand was almost crushed with the warmth of people's greetings. He worked terribly hard, never spared himself all through the tour. He became very tired, with a program which allowed almost no free time. On this journey, I got to know him very well indeed. I soon realized that under his smile, and despite all the fun we had, he was a lonely and sad person, always liable to deep depressions. From the time I first left home to go to school, I'd formed the habit of writing regularly and very fully to my mother. She kept all my letters. On one occasion, I wrote, I'm having a great time, but it's very difficult to keep David cheerful. At times, he gets so depressed and says he'd give anything to change places with me. And later on, I wrote, You've no idea what a friend David is to me. He may be six years older, but in some respects, he's the same age as me. I wish he wasn't the Prince of Wales, and then it would be so much easier to see lots and lots of him. He's such a marvelous person, and I suppose the best friend I've ever had. All in all, I had learned a tremendous lot. Looking back, I'd even say I came of age during this time. The result of seeing wonderful places meeting so many people in all walks of life, and also carrying a fair amount of responsibility. The Britain to which Mountbatten returned in October 1920 was making her first disagreeable acquaintance with post-war realities. This was the month of the Battle of Downing Street, between police and unemployed demonstrators. The short boom of 1919 was over. The first of the economic crises of the 20s had arrived. Unemployment rose from one and a quarter million in December 1920 to a peak of two and a half millions in 1921. Instead of the promised land fit for heroes to live in, the spectacle was seen of ex-soldiers begging in the streets.
1921, the coal industry was paralyzed by a strike and there were fears that the railwaymen and transport workers would join the miners. The government proclaimed a state of emergency and British industrial centers took on the look of occupied cities. Troops patrolled the streets and sailors were drafted to the mines to maintain the machinery and prevent flooding and other damage. This was a nasty job, although the Navy carried it out cheerfully enough as usual. But those of us who were concerned with law and order had a potentially even nastier one. I was put in charge of a platoon of 56 naval ratings, and we went into camp, first at Aintree, and then at Tidworth, and stood by in case we were needed. This is what is called action in aid of the civil power, and serving officers dread it. For most of those concerned, I dare say the whole thing was rather a picnic. Being in camp alongside the army was fun. But privately, I just hoped that we wouldn't have to be used against unfortunate people who were trying to obtain better pay and conditions. Luckily, we weren't used. We never even saw a striker, let alone a riot. But it was a huge relief when it all died down and we could return to our proper jobs. I went back to my ship which at that time was the Repulse, a sister ship of the Renown. We were due to go up to Invergordon, and my father came aboard at Sheerness and sailed up with us. He had just been promoted to Admiral of the Fleet, which was some atonement for the injustice which had forced him to retire in 1914. He thoroughly enjoyed himself, and so did the ship's officers, because he was a great raconteur with an unrivaled fund of naval reminiscences. When he left us at Invergordon, I went on up to Dunrobin Castle nearby to spend the weekend with the Duke and Duchess of Sutherland. My reason for taking this short leave was that a very attractive young girl whom I had recently met, called Edwina Ashley, had told me that she was going to be there. But my weekend was absolutely shattered by a telegram that came saying that my father had died suddenly, of heart failure. This was the most tremendous shock. I happened to be stopping at Dunrobin Castle with the Duke and Duchess of Sutherland the weekend that Dickie got the very sad news of his father's death. Uncle Louis, as he was known in the family, was to me a wonderful man. Having been raised in the Royal Navy, I admired him as a great seaman who devoted so much of his time to the service of his country. At that time, I was about to start on another world tour, this time to India and the Far East. Dickie had been with me on my, my, my first journey to Australia and New Zealand and had been a great companion and helped to me on that ar arduous trip. I was therefore anxious for him to go with me to India and Japan and I believe he was anxious to go with me as well. In fact, I have a letter that I wrote his mother, which started, Dearest Aunt Victoria, thank you ever so much for your most charming letter, which you sent to Dickie to give me. You know how much his friendship means to me, and that I just couldn't have done this trip if I hadn't got him with me. He means far more to me now than he ever did, as he is now a man, and not so much of a boy as he was last year, which makes such a difference. The 1921-1922 tour took us to India, Burma, Ceylon, Malaya, and Japan. This was my first acquaintance with countries which would one day play a great part in my life. Every country we went to had its fascination. But looking back, it's easy to see that my time in India was the high spot of the tour. Because there I found three loves, though on three very different planes. The first of them was India herself. India, when the Prince of Wales and Mountbatten arrived there in 1921, was a troubled country. It was still the brightest jewel in the crown of the King Emperor, the Prince's father. Its pomp and ceremony, its great palaces and monuments, its lavish entertainments, kept alive under the British the ancient traditions of the Mughal Empire. And the British had added their own significant contribution. 
irrigation, canals, railways, industrialization, education, and a greater political unity than ever before. Against all this, there remained the grinding poverty, disease, and recurring famine, afflicting the vast majority of India's enormous population. Out of all these factors grew the demand for Indian self-government. The war lent new urgency to this demand. During the war, 1,200,000 Indians had enlisted under the British flag. Indian troops had fought in France, at Gallipoli, in Egypt, East Africa, Palestine, and Mesopotamia. It was understood in India and in Britain that the reward for this great effort on Britain's behalf would be a definite speeding up of the moves towards self-government. A new nationalist leader emerged, Mohandas Karamchand Gandhi, Mahatma Gandhi, who preached non-cooperation with the British. Earlier in 1921, my great-uncle Arthur, the Duke of Connaught, had also been in India to inaugurate a most important constitutional reform. This lifted Indians out of mere consultation into real responsibility for many of the affairs of their country. It was a great step towards independence. But to Gandhi and his followers, who at that time included Muslims as well as Hindus, this was nothing like enough. When the Prince of Wales and I arrived in Bombay in November, there were riots and violence. Gandhi was demanding a boycott of the Prince's tour. The boycott was really a failure, except that it undoubtedly added to the strain on the Prince, who was still tired after the previous tour. We were never troubled by any hostile demonstrations, but sometimes the crowds were a bit thin. Gandhi was in Bombay when we arrived. I tried to contrive for him to meet the Prince, who was quite keen on the idea. The government of India were against it. I then asked if I could meet Gandhi myself, but the answer was no. The government really didn't want any contact at all. In fact, shortly afterwards, Gandhi was put in prison. I wonder if a meeting would have done any good. We might have established a useful contact. Leaving politics aside, I did absolutely fall in love with India. We visited all the principal Maharajas and Nawabs, the old ruling houses of India, who still lived in very great state. Many of them were immensely rich. They had their own armies. One of them even had an air force. And their hospitality was on a truly princely scale. Ten of their heirs apparent were on the prince's staff. The result was that we became lifelong friends. And these personal friendships were to be of enormous benefit to me many years later, when they had become rulers and I had to help to decide their future. And it was staying with them that I found my second love, polo. It was a game for which I had very little natural aptitude. In fact, I wasn't really a very good horseman when I started, but I loved it and took every chance I could of practicing. And when I was actually picked to play in a proper game, it was the thrill of my life. You can tell how good I was in those days from my diary. I wrote, in the last chucker, to my own intense surprise, I actually hit the ball three or four times. And then finally, my real love, which is also noted in the diary. On the 14th of February, 1922, I wrote, after dinner, there was a small dance. I danced one and two with Edwina. She had three and four with David. In the first dance, we sat out in her sitting room when I asked her if she would marry me. And she said she would. This was the Edwina Ashley I'd met the previous summer. She'd borrowed a hundred pounds and come out on a one-way ticket to India to stay with the Viceroy, Lord Reading. And so we actually became engaged in Delhi. The Prince of Wales was delighted and most helpful. I had to have the King's permission to marry. He saw to all that. Later I discovered there had only been one dissenting voice when we announced our engagement. The Vice Reigns, Lady Reading, who wrote to Edwina's aunt and said, I'm afraid she has definitely made up her mind about him. I hoped she would have cared for someone older, with more of a career before him. Edwina Ashley was an entirely desirable match, 
She was 20 years old at the time of her engagement, already in the bloom of an intelligent beauty which she never lost. Her grandfather on her mother's side was Sir Ernest Castle, a millionaire financier, who before the war had tried to use his influence to halt the naval arms race between Britain and Germany. Her father was Colonel Wilfred Ashley, who later became Lord Mount Temple. He was a grandson of the 7th Earl of Shaftesbury, the famous 19th century philanthropist, and Emily Cooper, whose mother had married the great Lord Palmerston. Edwina Ashley inherited beauty, brains and wealth, and added to them all her own remarkable personality. Edwina and I were blissfully happy. We were both keen to get married as early as possible, which rather worried my mother, who wasn't sure that we'd really known each other long enough and was afraid that the fortune Edwina was going to inherit might come between us. So I had to try to reassure her in my letters. I told her I was quite sure everything was going to be all right. Well, my mother believed me, and so now it was just a matter of waiting till the renown got home. The Mountbatten wedding took place on July the 18th, 1922, at St. Margaret's Westminster. It was the social event of the season. Officers of HMS Renown in full dress provided the guard of honor. The king and queen were present, and Queen Alexandra. The Prince of Wales was Mountbatten's best man. The sailors of the Renown entered into the spirit of the occasion with gusto. In fact, a little too much gusto. King George V was somewhat shocked at their exuberance and asked questions about the ship's discipline. After the wedding reception, I drove Edwina down here to Broadlands, her father's place inherited from Lord Palmerston. We knew that one day Edwina would inherit this house. <laughs> and I'm afraid that even before our wedding, I had rather cold-bloodedly written to my mother saying, Broadlands is in the most convenient part of England for the naval world. 75 miles from London, 30 from Portsmouth, 40 from Weymouth, and not too far from Plymouth. We spent the first part of our honeymoon here. I've always loved the place, and nowhere could be nicer for a honeymoon, as I think other members of our family would agree. And then we set off on our travels. We drove 700 miles through France to Santander to stay with my cousin, Queen Ina, and King Alfonso of Spain, and then across to Germany to stay with my uncle Ernie, the Grand Duke of Hesse. We were young, and we were happy, and we had a lot of fun. And then came the big excitement. We went to America. In 1922, America was the swinging country, the place where every young person wanted to go. It was the land of apparently limitless opportunity, the land of motor cars, the land of jazz and movies. We were treated as VIPs and met important people wherever we went. It was quite embarrassing. I was invited to visit the President of the United States and I was one of the speakers at a Navy League dinner packed with admirals and senior officers. Very disconcerting for a young lieutenant. But the highlight for me was Hollywood, the film capital of the world. Films fascinated me, always have done. I already possessed my own portable 35mm cine camera. But now, I learnt the art from Cecil B. DeMille and other famous professionals. We stayed at Pickfair, the 
home of our friends, Mary Pickford and Douglas Fairbanks. They were away, so our host was their partner, Charlie Chaplin. He was the most delightful host imaginable. And he made a film for us as a wedding present called Nice and Friendly. He wrote it and directed it. He and Edwina and I and the rest of our party were all in it. In his autobiography, he reproduced this still from the film with this caption. Breaking the news to Lord Mountbatten that he is no actor. How right he was. It was a marvellous honeymoon. Edwina was a wonderful companion, interested in everything, and with a tremendous capacity for making friends wherever we went. It doesn't fall to many young people to enjoy experiences such as these. But now, my leave was up. It was time for me to go back to work, back to my career in the Navy. <laughs> 